Good morning and greetings from Stanford in California. My name is Will Chu. I'm the co-director of StorageX Initiative along with Itui. We are delighted to welcome you uh, to our special symposium today. Over the past three months, we have convened an international panel of speakers and viewers such as yourself. Thank you so much for contributing to this event. Uh, today is no exception. I'm delighted to introduce two outstanding energy storage scientists and leaders from Europe. Today, we'll first hear from Professor Christina Yetstrom. She's a professor uh, from Uppsala uh, University in Sweden, and she's very well known for her work on understanding interfaces uh, in lithium-ion battery cathodes. Uh, in addition to her scientific accomplishments, she has also a number of leadership roles um, in Europe. Uh, she leads the Anstrom Advanced Battery Center, which is the largest of its kind in the Nordic countries. And more recently, she's also the spokesperson for the European Union project Battery 2030 Plus, working on sustainable battery technology development. Christina will talk about both aspects, the science, and also um, the research infrastructure needed. So we're very much delighted to hear from Christina. The second speaker is going to be Professor Saiful Islam from the University of Bath, also from the Department of Chemistry. Saiful is a pioneer in using computational methods to understand ionic transport and redox phenomena. Uh, he is very well known for his work in several elements, uh, hydrogen, um, lithium, oxygen, and iodine. And I just realized it actually spells Hilo, which makes me think of Hawaii for some reason at the moment. Uh, maybe that's a, 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 good reason, a good way to describe how I'm feeling. Maybe some of you feel that way as well. And like Christina, uh, he also serves a number of leadership positions. Among them, uh, he is the um, head of the cathodes theme in the UK's Faraday Institution and also UK's flagship program on battery R&D. So today I'm delighted to hear from both Christina and Seifel and hope to have a spirited discussion uh, with you, the audience, and also with them at the end of the seminar. So with that, let me ask Christina to come to the screen and tell us more about her activities and Battery 2030 Plus. Christina, please go ahead. Thank you so very much for this very kind uh, uh, introduction to me. And I have nothing more to add, more than I, that I'm also actually a trustee of the Faraday. So I can give you a very broad picture of what battery research is in Europe. And uh, my talk will be uh, a lot centered on what's going on in Europe at the moment, but also, of course, how my own research is linked into that. And uh, Battery 2030 Plus is a large scale long term European research initiative. And that, that explains my title, Long Term Visions and Research Needs for Studying the Batteries of the Future, because that is really what we have been asked to do for the uh, European Commission to make a roadmap which actually has a vision longer than 10 years to, to actually be able to, to put sort of different schemes and, and research projects uh, uh, on, the, on the agenda. And you can say that battery research has been of interest in US for a long time in, in Asia and Japan and Korea, China also for a long time. And, why is Europe awakening up now uh, quite late in this when most of the production is done in, Ch in Asia? Well, it is the expected large growth because we have emissions in Europe uh, stated by the European Commission that we should be the sort of first um, climate neutral continent in the world. And if you have this kind of, of vision and mission, you have to put actions in order. And batteries is one out of several, but uh, key technologies to enabling this. And of course, um, this uh, picture comes from European Commission. Uh, it, um, it is the electromobility, the transport sector, which is important. 
And then we can see a growing sector for energy storage, large scale storage to actually enable more of renewable electricity production into the grid. And if you look at the right hand side, you can see what do we expect? Uh, what kind of global battery demand do we expect per region? And now you can see that China in itself is a very good uh, example of a country now driving um, climate change um, technology, and they will have a lot of needs for their own market. You can see uh, that Europe has also a, a growing uh, expectations of more electric vehicles, etc. And actually expect more than US. And I think that is because it's a clearer vision in Europe what we want to achieve when it comes to climate neutrality. In my own country, which is Sweden, we even say that we should be the first fossil free country in the world. We see if we manage with that, we are only 10 million people. So we, <laughs> we are not a very large country. And, uh, and you, European market, European Commission is putting up a lot of regu regulation and uh, to support this transition. And one example, which is affecting also US and other countries, other countries you, outside Europe, is that we have put a restriction on how much carbon dioxide emissions a, a, a personal car can emit. And very uh, late, just a uh, half a year ago, uh, right before the COVID crisis, we also had regulation for, for heavy duty vehicles, how much carbon dioxide they are allowed to emit. And this means that if US companies want to sell cars in Europe, they have to obey to these legislations. And there's even a new battery directive uh, coming up soon, which also will be a, a lot uh, pushing this. But if you look at this, um, especially here, that um, Europe is still a quite small part of the whole world and the expectations for the whole world, that became a worry a few years ago that the number of, of uh, batteries, battery cells available for European companies, especially the automotive companies, that's a strong industry in Europe, that they were not uh, strong enough to, to uh, on this market to really safeguard enough of battery cells to really make this transition. So there is now a strong, strong commitment in Europe to try to increase the number of uh, battery cell producers. And that is a quite new thing. And of course, it has the effect that you have Asian companies coming into Europe. Elgi, the uh, Korean company, they have now one of the largest factories, is actually in Poland. In my country, no, we have a new company called Norfolk, who is building uh, on Swedish green uh, sustainable electricity uh, and on the a lot of mining opportunities. We have the Scandinavian countries where we have graphite, we have cobalt, we have nickel, etc. And we are finding more and more of that uh, and now looking for it in the Finland, Sweden, Norway. So here, also in Norway, there is now an uh, idea of open a gigafactory to make battery cells. There is one coming up in, in the UK called British Volt. So there are lots of activity. There is one coming up also in France and Germany is very strong in this. And this is sort of the uh, report from European Commission in April 2019, where they see that the number of electric vehicles on the road from 2018 would increase uh, dramatically to uh, 2040. And you know, we have 1 billion uh, cars, uh, passenger cars uh, on this globe. So it's a lot, it's actually a lot of new questions come, that comes up with this. Can we make uh, the battery sustainable enough? Will we have enough raw materials? What does it mean to produce a battery? Will it cost more energy than you actually gain? And, and so on. But still, uh, even if we don't have the full market of all cars on batteries, it will be a massive growth. And so far, we can say that the growth, growth in Europe is considerable. Uh, if you look at the number of new cars 
uh, sales. And this means that also these cells of, of primarily lithium ion batteries, if you look at the nearest 10, 15 years, will, that will also grow. And then the, the hope then for the European Commission is that we also, also with this new, a lot of new money put into battery factories in Europe would actually increase the number of jobs. And for 2028, they hope for uh, a share of 7 to 25 percent. Let's see if we manage to do that in Europe or not. Um, therefore, I put up a very a big uh, sort of program going from research, where you have the battery 2030 plus long term research, going to more short term and medium term research and applied research. Uh, with a network uh, called Batteries Europe in, in, um, in Europe, where you have all the sectors represented. You have the long-term research, you have the advanced material group, you have a recycling group, you have a sustainability group, you have a digitalization group, you have also a group for, for transport applications, another one for large-scale applications. Working together to put up the frameworks for different funding schemes for Europe. Uh, and uh, since I am then the director of the long-term research for Battery 2030 Plus in Batteries Europe, I also try to push that we need to have long-term research at the same time as we have uh, more of the industry-related uh, issues. 2018, uh, no, 2017, there was something called the European Battery Alliance, EBA. Um, launched and this EBA is actually collecting all the companies in Europe that have interest in batteries. So there you find the mining companies, the materials companies, the automotive companies, etc. And they are also putting up schemes now to try to work together cross sectorial uh, to work. And uh, one outcome to that is that there are industrialization programs and regional programs, innovation funds put into this. So a lot of investment money going into this. And now we have the COVID and what that means for, for the funding of these schemes is still a little bit unclear, but you can see at least that the thinking is that we should cover uh, the whole value chain for batteries, but also the whole value chain, you can say from research up to industrialization and have that in parallel. And uh, so it's an interesting, uh, uh, development and of course we miss that UK decided to go for a, for a Brexit but uh, with Battery 2030 plus we do have British scientists also involved in some of our projects which we think is very important and Faraday is one of our supporting organizations here so we try to have a friendly kind of relationship with the best of, of the citizens in, in this region. So um, uh, it's a lot of political things, and but the politics have got the industry with them. And I'm very happy to see that we now are trying to launch a partnership uh, in Europe where the Commission actually decides on a pot of money to support this area for, for at least seven years. So you don't have to have these fragmented, scattered things, but really put it together. And this is worked out now, it's not finalized. I hope the decisions will come now in September. And we don't know how much money it is, but at least this is the work we are doing. Europe has worked uh, on a strategic energy technology plan with a special action for batteries. And I think this is sort of the European vision now that we should work for different generations of lithium-ion batteries. I'm sorry that this picture is a little bit blurry, but it was not better from the source I got it. So it, uh, at least I can tell you that in the nearest time, we expect new generations, what's called 3B at, uh, and, and uh, 3A, 3B, et cetera. And that is based on different cathode materials. And it's not secret that Norfolk in Sweden will go for N NMC 811. And of course, it's graphite silicon anodes. And then it's a question if we can increase the nickel content even further and also increase the silicon content even further in carbon. And generation four, 
uh, is expected to be all solid state batteries with lithium as I know and uh, but also conversion materials uh, like and then it's lithium sulfur and that the lithium oxygen batteries comes at generation five and I think there is no really a, any idea when it would come. So, but in this sort of um, European roadmap for when, what chemistries are coming when, we do miss uh, out on the sodium ion, the redox flow, multivalent, et cetera, et cetera. And you can fill that list with more chemistries uh, if you wish. And that is a little bit uh, of, of uh, a problem, of course, because this uh, roadmap is made for transportation sector. But uh, I can tell you that uh, in Battery 2030 Plus, which is this large scale initiative, we want to invent the batteries of the future. And that means that we can include all these battery systems. And of course, the idea is to provide industry with breakthrough technologies, but also to have long term European leadership in markets and in, few, and, uh, in uh, applications and in research. And to do this, we said we have a chemistry neutral approach. We don't tell that we are specifically working on redox flow or sodium or whatever. Um, instead, we are uh, trying to put up schemes that can enable these different chemistries. So we are establishing a battery interface, you know, because we do think that the interfaces is not because only because of me that I worked on interfaces for a long time, but it's actually because it's it's a, it is a sort of a, a holy grail still to understand that, and and then really to accelerate the materials discovery process. So we try to take a holistic view with modeling tools and high throughput uh, experimental tools. We are very happy to see that Europe is putting money into high performance computing in the Euro HPC. We have excellent synchrotrons and neutron facilities in Europe. We see that the joint organizations are supporting the battery research because a lot of our research all over the, the world use these techniques and a multitude of these techniques. And we think that the smart batteries or I don't know if a, a person is smart, I don't know if a, a battery can be smart, but at least a, a, a smart functionalities in a battery, like self-healing and sensors at a much more detailed way, something we'll also work on. And of course, when you do these things, you have always to think about safety, regulatory issues, cost effectiveness, assembly, etc. So you can say that the commission said we, they want us to be in this segment, materials, new materials and concepts, uh, low energy cell production, manufacturability, recyc recyclability. And the reason for this is that one wants to promote production, production of batteries. So there is where we, you find battery 2030 plus. And uh, just to say something very quickly on uh, our biggest project, uh, we have now a project portfolio. People have put together consortia and applied, and it has been an open, transparent process. And we will start with our project, projects first of September. And our biggest is an auto autonomous platform for accelerated discovery of future batteries. Of course, the Matthias genome in the US that was started many years ago has been instrumental for this, but trying to get it further and to make it more holistic also involving really the um, high throughput experiments hand to hand. And it's ties very again to in Denmark who is uh, the leading this and we have industry involved. And that is something really interesting because if, if you want to do work on artificial intelligence instruments, etc., you need a lot of data. And we have industries that can provide a lot of test data and so on. And of course we have to do that in a very restricted, uh, safe way, so we don't just sort of put the companies in any risk. But they find this interesting to do this uh, artificial intelligence orchestrated discovery. Um, it's called Big Map. Have this uh, little logo, and then we have projects, three projects on smart sensors to really go into acting sensing in the cell at a very detailed level. And we have um, also something to play with new chemistry to see if we can add some cell feeling capabilities that the sensors 
can sort of take in and make um, work, inspired by drug delivery systems in medicine and etc. Uh, and we have two projects starting in the self healing and then trying to build in this. And this has, of course, a lot to do also with the big map projects. We have trying to find a portfolio where the different parts can make a flagship for Europe in in this uh, battery 2030. So we have a roadmap where you can read about our short-term, medium-term and long-term goals. And we, you can follow us on Twitter and LinkedIn and see a little bit more about our launch, our event, the 1st of September. So far, we have done a preparatory work to make this roadmap. And um, since I then, uh, why am I the leader of this? Yeah, well, <laughs> I have some leadership experience from other big projects, but I also lead this Youngstrom Advanced Battery Center in, in Sweden. And we do some research, which of course is relevant to the program we have. And uh, if you look at the batteries, they do a degrade and how fast they degrade depends on how much they are used and how much, uh, how they are used rather than how much they are used. And uh, if you look at the battery, I, I got this uh, picture from from Marie Tarascon. You have many interfaces uh, that you can define in a battery. So, if you really win, want to pinpoint the details in this, you have to to uh, use a number of techniques. It's not so simple that you can use just one technique. And many of the uh, reactions are so subtle that uh, the techniques we have have their limitations. And if you want to push some techniques you have to work together uh, in, in larger consortia to do this. And of course, there's a whole list of reasons for degradation in batteries. And uh, if you make it very short, you have loss of lithium inventory, you can kind of drying out of the electrolyte, you have salt from the, that precipitates in the different pores. And, and um, if you get lower lifetime, you, you get, of course, lower capacity and it has to do with the bulk structure, the interface structure to the different components, what operational window you have, impurities, etc, etc. Uh, and uh, we started early and I think sometimes you can actually go back. It's so much published in this area. So if you go back a little bit of literature, you might find that uh, we were not, we, were, we did things before. This is an example of a model system where you compare just the salt LiPF6 in the same kind of solvent as LiBF4 at room temperature. And the LiPF6, you get a really nice smooth layer of very small crystalline lithium fluoride. I get a bit of larger chunky ones for LiBF4. They can both cycle well at uh, this temperature, no problem. If you increase the temperature, you get larger, chunkier crystals of lithium fluoride growing in the polymeric, mushy, organic uh, compound. And, uh, but still, it's fine to uh, cycle LiPF6 electrodes uh, without any problem. But for LiBF4, you get even chunkier ones. It looks like you really break apart this organic covering mushy layer and it fails to cycle at 60 degrees. If, if you have a fully lithiated graphite, it will just, uh, lithium will go out. You can see that this was uh, May 2001. So we can also see from the studies we did then, it was very much based on, on microscopy and XPS studies, that uh, this lithium fluoride layer was sort of small crystal. It's all through these organic layers. It was not just a layer close to the surface. Uh, so it was sort of spread out. And uh, that was lost with the other one. And if you think, uh, what is the difference between the salt? Well, this gives the Lewis acid BF3, which is much more reactive than the Lewis acid PF5. So that's one explanation. It was a pity because LiBF4 is more stable in, in the bottle in the lab then LiPF6, that the grades and easier get yellow and, and absorb, it's much more hygroscopic. But so this was interesting. And then uh, 12 years later, we used new methods. So you can really use what's called HUXPES. It's a hard X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy. It's a kind of XPS technique where you can tune your photon energy so you can go deeper and deeper in. 
And there we could sort of more or less confirm that the lithium fluoride crystals, you could uh, see them all through this mushy layer of organics. Though you had more of salt uh, reduction products close to the surface and the more of the mushy organic on top of the SEI. And if you look at this case, it was graphite and this was a lithium iron phosphate. Uh, the cathode electrolyte interface is much thinner and it's more of this mushy type of organics that you have on the top here than it, uh, than it, than it is uh, for the graphite. So, um, this inspired us to look at many different systems. And this is a typical quite new study we've done where we have silicon graphite electrode versus LENMC, uh, one third and a third done. And you uh, looking at different salts here and different additives to the salts, uh, we could see that uh, if you really go to towards a more organic rich uh, compound, you actually got better cycling. Um, and this is a typical study. You can read many of them in literature, different additives, different ways of combining the additives, etc., etc. And this is a typical example where, as I would say, that we need to accelerate our understanding. We need to much more having, maybe like they have at the University of Münster with Martin Minter's group that uh, he spoke here a few weeks ago where you have a system where you can screen additives and electrolytes to so, so, so come further quicker in this, because this, so it, it means a lot for, for the performance. Um, and that's why I think you, what we hope that we will do in the Battery 2030 class will be important. So uh, um, many of the chemistries used today in automotive, uh, in electric vehicles, uh, in the batteries are quite good. They can even promise eight years and even longer if you look at the results. But what happens if you go to new chemistries? Then we have again to look at that specific chemistry, what's going on and, and try to see if we can generalize some findings or not. And I just got so tempted by, by uh, sitting here together with Saifo um, to say a little bit of one of the oxyfluorides, uh, the lithium vanadium oxide fluoride. And these results are from a, a EU project called LI Rich FCC, led by uh, Maximilian Fischner from KIT and, and Helmut Center Ulm in Germany. And this is a lithium rich disordered oxide salt oxyfluoride material. Here you have um, oxygen and fluorine uh, in different proportions, and you have also lithium and adium in this structure. And you have a lot of surface degradation and a lot of capacity fading. It has a high theoretical capacity um, because it can have a two electron transfer reaction. I think the first material was suggested by Gerhard Seder 2014, but it was Maximilian Fischner who synthesized this first 2015. And about two thirds of this capacity is the practical capacity. And here you can see how it, it really degrades. Uh, this is only 50 cycles. And again, using this HACSPES and being able to go through the interfa uh, interface, through the uh, outer surface, into the near surface, into the bulk. What can we say about these structures? And can we say something about the degradation? And um, here are some graphs. and. Uh, if you go here, uh, up here, you can see that from the left to the right, you go from very close to the surface, deeper and deeper into the material. And if you go down here, you have first the pristine, you have the one cycle, the charge to charge, you have the five cycles, the charge to charge, and you have 50 cycles. And uh, the, the short story of this is that at the outer surface, the vanadium very quickly becomes vanad uh, redox inactive. So you get uh, vanadium five plus and you can't do so much. But going in, it takes much longer. In the bulk, it takes about 50 cycles to really reach this um, um, uh, inactive situation. And if you look at the carbon spectra, what kind of 
cathode electrolyte interface because this is a cathode and we are used to have rather thin cathodes interfaces like I showed for the lithium ion phosphate case and uh, here after five cycles and 50 cycles we can see the lot of organic uh, reactions on the surface for, uh, and it's actually growing thicker and thicker and it seems like instead of having more of a ca cathode electrolyte interface we have more of a a, a, um, a uh, SCI actually like an anode so just by having these kind of reactions going on in the material, we can induce extra uh, reactions in the electrolyte, which leads to these uh, thicknesses. So this is just in schematics, what we think is happening during this. And you can see that it's also quite dynamic. We, we do di from discharge to charge, from discharge to charge, you actually grow this layer thicker and thicker. But it, thins out also. So we also can see that, okay, we have some redox activity, but it's probably anionic redox activity. And I have also other spectroscopic data as evidence for that, but that you can read in the paper. Um, so if the degradation starts at the surface, what can we do? We can have additives in electrolyte, we can have surface coating, you know, and we can substitute vanadium part of it with some other metal. And of course, all these things we are testing all the time. And uh, also, can we systemize this to a to more screening situation, like in battery 2030 plus, if, if we can move faster with these kind of materials or discard them. But if you really want to know what's going on in the interface, you have to develop new methods. And this is uh, uh, a very quick example of uh, that you can do a uh, ambient pressure photoelectron spectroscopy and uh, then see what's going on in the surface. You can actually like, cycle the surface. And um, I was going to end my presentation now. I know I have very little time left by showing though, uh, if you, some of you from industry, but this is just not esoteric research as such. It's actually be used to understand uh, commercial systems and we do work in Sweden, something called the Swedish Electromobility Center, where we have two companies having products in the same segment. They are both selling buses and heavy duty, and that's Garnier and Volvo Group, and uh, working together to try to understand what's going on in different batteries. And this was just the first uh, charging station uh, study uh, with a big prismatic cell of the NMC versus graphite commercially made, cycled by the industry in a controlled way, where we had actually a, a post-mortem studies and looked at and made uh, different kinds of analytical, um, used uh, different characterization methods to really look at the, the different um, uh, parts of the electrode. And you can see that it, it's actually uh, the, the yellow rows that you roll out from this prismatic cell that you have almost like mechanical uh, differences and uh, different colors in these materials. And if you look at the, these cells, they uh, failed already between 2C and 3C in, in how they could handle part, part cycling and the internal resistance grow dramatically to 2C and 3C, even worse for 4C. And the question is, of course, what is the problem? And the problem is uh, a lot of what's going on it, at the different parts that you have some inhomogeneities that you can show with this kind of surface techniques when it comes to uh, the amount of, of flooring you find for the different cases and also if it's at the edge or the center or center and middle, halfway into the electrode, etc. And this can give you some kind of, of uh, information and if you relate that also to the mass changes you can see with uh, c-rate the mass changes actually drops for the negative electron while they are rather constant for the positive you can see that the thickness of the surface layers grow uh, up to 3c and they drop and you can see that porosity uh, also changes and then drops at 4c 
And uh, if you put all these data together to some kind of conclusion, you can see that the cycle life drops dramatically between 2C and 3C, 4C. You can see the graphite impedance increases until it drops to 4C. You can see C sw cell swelling being rather constant and then choof to 4C. So we have actually different mechanisms dominating um, at different charging rates. So you have an accelerated plating at 3C, not a surprise. Everyone knows that with high uh, speed cycling, you get the uh, lithium plating. But at 4C, you don't have only the, um, the plating, you have actually extensive gas evolution also. So that contributes to the large uh, cell impedance. And then you get exfoliation and uh, uh, accelerated lithium inventory loss going to the graphite electrode. And, um, of course, uh, going back to the battery 2030 plus ideas, this kind of knowledge we also need to, to, uh, to accelerate. So yes, by, by um, summarizing this, that uh, now 1st of September, the battery 2030 plus starts, and we have more than 100 partners, and it will be an interesting uh, experience for Europe. Is this the largest program in Europe? I would say at the European level, it's one of the largest. If you look at some of the countries like Germany, they have national programs that are even larger than this. But this, uh, to be an, an, a European effort, this is long. So thank you so much for listening to me and I hope you have many questions and I can, so many names and, and funding agencies that I need to thank, but um, I would particularly like to, to uh, thank the people at KTH and the automotive companies in Sweden and Germany and my, my colleague in the interface group and uh, at KIT for this materials you have seen in this presentation. So thank you. Christina, thank you very much for the wonderful talk and also for your leadership and service to the battery community. I know this is a huge amount of work. So we have many questions covering different aspects of the talk. So maybe I will start uh, with the scientific ones. Uh, so these are questions that our viewers have uh, sent to us. So the first question is on CEI versus SEI on cathode versus anode. Um, it's been shown that the SEI on the anode can be very heterogeneous. It could have uh, be very compact in some places and very extended in others. Yeah. Is the same true for cathodes? I think you were hinting at that. Um, could you discuss briefly the heterogeneity, maybe in the thickness in the morphology of SEI, uh, CEI on the cathodes? I think that's a very good question because if you, you keep to a um, voltage range, which is sort of, okay for long-term cycling of the material, you see very thin layers on the cathode. But as soon as you want to, to change something, and you change your potential window, or you go to a higher speeds when cycling, you start to form in, uh, heterogeneous reactions. And you, it seems in some cases that you even might have some crosstalk of components between the different uh, electrodes. It is a very, very um, tough chemistry. You are very reductive on one side and very oxida oxidative at the other side. So um, I think my example of this vanadium fluoride, oxyfluoride compound, shows that uh, it's not so simple as you are saying, oh, we have a thick one on the anode and a thin one on the cathode. It's, it's very much dependent on on how stable also the bulk structure is and, and the uh, surface structure of the compound. And you know, I didn't say that, but vanadium can of course also uh, corrode and uh, actually react and be transported from the electrolyte into, onto the graph graphite uh, side, side if you don't have um, proper interfaces or, or coatings and so on. It's a big matrix of things. And that's, I guess, why we work in this area. It is complex and that's why it's fun. Indeed. Um, the next question is uh, maybe even a harder question. Um, so is it possible, and, and what is the state of the art knowledge on the ionic conductivity and also the electronic conductivity 
of CEIs and SEIs and treating them as mixed conductors rather than as ideal solid electrolytes? Uh, well, it's also, that's a tough one. Uh, it's a question if the one on the C on the cathode is so thin that you can almost have like a electron tunneling through it. It doesn't look like that. It looks, uh, however, like the SCI is more like a physical barrier where you really can have um, uh, a transport. There you may, it's mainly ionic uh, conductivity. But I think this that really understand how you have the electron transfer reactions really point that in, at a dynamic level. That's something we suggest for the next phase of uh, European funding actually because uh, it is very intriguing and we might need laser methods to really be able to pinpoint uh, this in a good way. Um, for the stable systems though, I do think that uh, we have more of ionic than a little bit of electronic conductivity through these layers. Wonderful, Christina, thank you. So related to characterizing SCIs and CEIs, mm -hmm. um, you showed a lot of results on post-mortem mm -hmm. characterization of um, interfaces. Um, mm -hmm. Could you discuss briefly the opportunities and perhaps roadmap for characterizing uh, SCI growth in situ dynamically so we can understand more about the underlying uh, kinetic processes? Yes. Um, if you want to understand the, the kinetic processes, of course, you have to do it in in operando mode. And uh, I think yeah, that we are trying to develop now in Europe and I think in US too, and of course in, in Asia, um, ambient pressure systems, because many of the earlier studies, the ones I've shown you, are made uh, with techniques with high vacuum techniques. So you actually pump off some of the materials and it's always ex situ and it's always post-mortem, you can say, but we need to see it in life. And of course, with the imaging techniques uh, that both the neutrons and X-rays are coming, are, are constantly becoming better and better. I hope that we can gain more results, but I think we will continue to have to combine different techniques to be able to really say something about the kinetics of it. I mean, our own studies, I, I just blurred over it, um, where we have looked at uh, droplets of, of electrolyte on, on uh, metal and see if we can cycle it and so on in, in a spectrometer at ambient pressure, shows that it's, uh, uh, I think it confirms a lot that uh, the SEI is a physical barrier. Um, but you can also see from different components when they actually reduce on, on the surface, uh, which is interesting. So I think we need to continue to work on these techniques and uh, we are not there yet, but uh, so we have a lot to do together to solve the, the characterization part for the next generation of studies. I couldn't agree more, Christina, and uh, I'm glad that you're also now deciding, um, you know, where the money goes. So this is very exciting to see some resources <laughs> Um, go into this. I, my dream is always to be able to have the ultimate spatial resolution and time resolution that goes mm -hmm. from, you know, seconds to years. I know that's impossible probably, but one can dream and I can watch mm -hmm. the SCI grow uh, as the battery ages. I don't know. We'll, we'll see if that can happen. So I, maybe, We ahead. have to have these dreams to push a little bit forward. We have a saying in Sweden, if you can't reach, uh, you have to aim for the stars so that you can reach the treetops or the tops of the trees. Yes, indeed. Very inspiring. Um, let me just ask one final question on the details and I want to zoom out a bit to some broader questions. So uh, there's a final question on the importance of foreignated chemistry uh, for silicon. So it's, it's, it's sort of generally understood that is an important aspect of forming a stable SCI for silicon. Mm -hmm. uh, you show some results that did not involve um, fluorinated chemistry uh, for the mm -hmm. additives, um, the ALIBOB and also um, VC. Mm -hmm. uh, so the question mm -hmm. is, 
if you can comment on why that works particularly well in that particular uh, combination. Yes, there were a lot of things I didn't tell you. I think the um, how you make your electrode is very important and uh, you have also a lot of carbon in this electrode, of course, that helps, uh, helps to sort of cover this uh, SCI, you can say, also for the silicon. You have also binders, and, and that is a very big uh, issue in my research group, uh, my colleagues. Uh, you have some young colleagues really being uh, smart in thinking of new kinds of binders that can actually help silicon and uh, try to, uh, to sort of, yeah. So, so it's, it's all these things uh, that helps also with the salts, I think, to build this kind of layers. So it's a multi-complex co problem again. Complexity seemed to be the overwhelming theme here. This is good for <laughs> a scientist, I think. Um, yes. we, zooming we out a bit, um, so for the two final questions, um, you talked about the oxyfluorides as a potential um, substitution chemistry uh, for the cathodes. Can you talk a little bit about the scale-up challenges of producing oxyfluorides? Um, <laughs> I, I think maybe um, this uh, oxyfluor, yes, this uh, vanadium one, I'm not sure that uh, it's more than a model system, but I think there are other ones. I hope that my colleague Saifu will talk about the manganese one, uh, where you can maybe see more of potential for that. I think yeah, we have learned a lot about this compound because it has a two electron transfer reaction. But, um, and this kind of model studies are very important if we want to find something that can be upscaled and commercialized. And of course, everything where you have fluorine chemistry is a bit tough when you're upscaling, I, I would say. Uh, it's also a sustainability question. Right, and this is a good segue to the final question. Um, in terms of cathode scaling up, there's a lot of discussion on the carbon footprints and waste water in particular during the raw material extraction mm. from the earth and also the processing. Um, mm. Has the consortium thought more about the total environmental impact of material processing and are there ideas on how to mitigate that? Uh, I would not say that that is in the scope of Battery 2030 Plus, but it is in the scope of Batteries Europe. And it's very important for European companies. And the reason why Norfolk is positioned, its factory in the north of Sweden is both cheap green electricity from hydropower, but, but also access to a lot of, of water, of course, which would mean that in their case, the um, the production will have a lower carbon dioxide uh, sort of footprint. But um, I think this is extremely important in uh, every aspect of this value chain or the value circle that I showed you that we have that uh, perspective. And that is the perspective we have to have also in battery 2030 plus. We have to have a manufacturability aspect. We have to say to ourselves, this uh, material studying now, is, is it possible to really do make a good manufacturing of it? This censoring concept I'm suggesting, can we really upscale that in a fair way that makes it economically and sustainability uh, useful or not? And then we have to select from that perspective. Uh, but I think that is a discussion we need to continue with. I can see that some of the coming ideas for projects in Europe will be related to this. Absolutely. Well, this is very exciting to hear. We're funding yeah. onto it. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Thank you, Christina. And uh, before we switch to Seifel here, there was also a few uh, requests uh, from our colleagues in Europe. Um, they are wondering how they could get involved, uh, both from industry and academia, with your programs. So I presume they can email you directly and, um, and continue the discussion on how they could contribute. Sure. Um, sure. so Christina, thank you so much uh, for, for your talk. And now uh, I would uh, like to ask Seifel to come to the stage. Seifel, now the floor is yours. Okay. Um, 
Well, thank you, Will. And well, I'll start off with thanks and then a confession. Uh, the thanks are to you, Will and Yi, for the kind invitation to be part of this um, excellent series of international seminars. It's a real um, privilege and honor. And also thank the people behind the scenes at Stanford, uh, Tracy Turner and uh, Justin Warren, because they've been great at uh, getting this set up. Um, the confession is that I'm a bit anxious about this talk. Um, I'm anxious because uh, I'm not exactly sure who the audience is. Usually you can see them. Uh, so I suspect there's undergrads out there, PhD students, postdocs, industrialists, um, and top professors. So I wasn't sure about how to pitch it. So I asked Will, what shall I talk about? And he said, about 30 minutes. So uh, for the next 29 minutes, I'll give you a flavor of some atomic scale insights into soil electrolytes and lithium rich cathodes. So as it's a flavor, let me start off with, uh, so the menu is really, um, I'm going to start off with a brief starter on um, battery research themes. And then I'm going to move over to the main course, which is to do with uh, solid electrolytes, particularly model system, these anti perovskites And then I suppose for dessert is um, a final topic on lithium rich cathodes. And Christina mentioned the lithium vanadium oxyfluoride. I'm going to focus on another disordered oxyfluoride, the manganese um, archetypal system. And then lastly, um, a few concluding remarks, maybe some general remarks about the work that we've done and the way forward. So let me start off with uh, battery research themes. I don't have to remind everybody about the, the makeup of a, a rechargeable lithium ion battery. But in terms of research themes, I think one of the most active areas is obviously to do with cathodes, um, trying to get um, higher energy densities. So this could be around nickel rich NMC, uh, lithium rich oxides, and also uh, polyanion systems, which is, um, was, has been a big area, but perhaps um, slightly less so at the moment. On the anode side, um, replacing graphite um, with a bit of silicon, with some silicon or with silicon completely, and then the holy grail of uh, lithium metal. Um, people are moving away from the organic electrolyte, maybe getting some more solid state batteries. So we're looking at solid state uh, systems. The last thing I was going to say is that obviously beyond lithium ion, there's sodium ion and magnesium. And then beyond intercalation, there's a lot of work on lithium sulfur and lithium air. My two focuses on, in this talk is going to be around the cathode and the solid electrolyte work. So um, it's known that if we want to make major breakthroughs, major advances, uh, we've got to think about new materials, uh, perhaps new concepts, and a deeper fundamental understanding. Um, I mean, in a way that, as a materials chemist myself, that describes my research philosophy. And the way we try and um, understand those materials is a, a synergy between modeling and experiment. So uh, largely modeling work at Bath, linking up with experimental collaborators at Bath and elsewhere on synthesis, diffraction, electrochemistry, spectroscopy, microscopy, a whole range of different techniques that were discussed uh, partly in, the, in Christina's talk. Um, I, I know it's old news, but I really wanted to acknowledge uh, the Nobel Prize in this area. And I said finally, because it's long, long, long overdue. Um, and um, I know been, people have been lobbying for John Goodenough to get this prize. For those not so sure, um, John Goodenough is the one on the left. <laughs> and uh, the one on the right is a, an actual president who believed in science and scientific evidence. Um, the other um, prize winners we acknowledge is Stan Whittingham, a good friend and colleague, and gave an excellent opening 
talk to this um, international series a few months back and Akira Ishino from my co in Tokyo. So I just want to acknowledge the Nobel Prize and congratulations to all three of them. Um, let me move on to the main course on soil electrolytes. Uh, the context first, I think we know that soil electrolytes have the potential for greater stability, safety, um, energy density if you combine it with lithium metal and uh, lifetime, I suppose, as well. But there are issues. The issues to do with conductivity in the solid state, um, transport mechanisms, um, interfaces, not only within the electrolyte, but with the electrodes. And within the electrolyte, it's grain boundaries, which I'll touch on briefly. There are a number of families of materials being looked at. Uh, probably the most studied are, have been the garnets, um, the LLZO. Um, we've been looking at some antiperovskites, lithium rich antiperovskites, and the one with the highest lithium ion conductivity, the one on the right, uh, developed by Kanu in Tokyo, is the, um, the, the lysicon, the thiolysicons, based on um, LGPS, lithium germanium phosphorus sulfide. So that has the highest lithium ion conductivity to date. Um, We've, um, together with uh, colleagues at Amiens, uh, Christian Mascalier, our PhD student Theo, and uh, Piero at Bath and James at Bath, uh, now at Singapore and Newcastle respectively, we managed to publish a, re a review article uh, end of last year in Nature Materials, and we were fortunate enough to get um, the cover image as well. So if you're interested in a general review on the fundamentals of inorganic, um, that's in that Nature Materials review. So let me move on to these anti Uh So they're interesting materials. They were looked at by uh, Zhao and Damon a few years back. They found high ionic conductivity around 10 to the minus 3 centimeters, Siemens per centimeter at room temperature, relatively low cost materials. Um, John Goodenough has been looking at them and various others. There have been some debate uh, about the levels of conductivity and their migration barriers. And some of the debate revolves around the possible grain boundary resistance. But there's always, as with a lot of grain boundary work, limited atomistic understanding, real quantitative understanding of grain boundary effects. Um, the perovskite structure is, I'm sure, um, is, sure, is well known to most of you, if not all of you. What I find fascinating about um, this structure is the anti-perovskite. So here, the, um, the center of the octahedra is occupied by oxygen. The corners of that octahedron are now the lithium, the cations, and right at the center, the A site, is the large halide, the, the chloride ion. So that's why it's an anti-proskite. So in ABX3 formula, it's CLOLI3. So the starting point for our uh, work was to do with um, modeling the, um, oh yeah, first of all, the grain boundary issue, sorry. So this is just a schematic of the electrode and some particles and a schematic of a, a grain boundary. And as I said, the atomistic structures for a lot of these new materials aren't well known. Um, we thought we'd start off the perovskite because the perovskite oxide grain boundaries are better known. There's some debate about the migration barriers. Um, some of the calculated barriers in the past have been considerably lower than the experimental values. So we wanted to understand that. And there's been some work on the oxybromide uh, analog where they quote, grain boundary contribution dominates the total impedance. And this is from um, AC impedance work but they weren't sure what the grain boundary structure was. And this is work of Lee and Howard. So our starting point, and this is work of 
James Dawson and Piero Canepa when they were at Bath. Um, we can construct from simulation um, different grain boundary structures. We can actually look at um, what's called the coincidence site theory, where we can look at different orientations. So that's just showing uh, on the left a schematic of how you might form a grain boundary structure. The sigma three um, is observed in perovskite oxides um, um, and particularly barium titanate and calcium titanate. Um, so we model the crystal structure and we've reproduced the bulk crystal structure um, as you'd expect from uh, simulation work. So the starting point is to look at different grain boundary um, energies and grain boundary structures. So on the left, we've got a kind of a ball and stick model of sigma three and sigma five. Even if you don't know the notation, um, don't worry, the sigma three is a bit more close packed at the grain boundary. Sigma five tends to be op more open with lower coordination at the grain boundary structure. We can calculate um, the grain boundary energies, and I'm just summarizing them as just a simple plots. We find that the sigma three have relatively low energies. In fact, they're, they're lower energies than the equivalent sigma three in barium titanate. So again, suggesting quite considerable population of um, sigma three type grain boundaries. The sigma five are much higher energy, suggesting that they're um, less common or less um, concentrated within this antiperovskite. So the general conclusion here is that the low energies compared to the oxides suggest a high concentration of grain boundaries within this um, antiperovskite structure. So the next question is how do they affect the conductivity. So we perform very long time scale um, potentials based molecular dynamics from which we can derive um, diffusion coefficients and then we can actually convert them to conductivities. So let's look at the um, Arrhenius plot. So this is the Arrhenius plot, the classic log sigma t against one over t. Um, the pink line is the experimental data from Howard's group and the black line is our calculated bulk value which we've extrapolated down to lower temperatures and the dotted line are the sigma three um, conductivities from the grain boundaries which we've extracted. So a few things you can see straight away. Our calculated bulk does not accord terms of slope with experimental value in fact the migration barrier is about 0.6 uh, 0.3 ev uh, from the bulk whereas it's 0.6 ev experimentally the second thing to note is that we're finding that the grain boundary conductivity is lower than the bulk again not again but showing that there's would expect significant grain boundary resistance so this is confirming that there would be some significant grain boundary resistance within these materials with a higher barrier and a lower conductivity. So I think for, from our, this is um, some work that we published in JAX a couple of years ago, we've shown for the first time in this anti some quantitative atomistic insights into the grain boundary resistance and the migration barriers and helps to explain why the calculated DFT values were lower than experimental if you just consider the bulk migration without considering the grain boundary resistance as well. So we've extended this work, um, I won't have time to talk about it, but we've extended this work to some sulfides as well, where we find much, much lower grain boundary resistance. The sulfides tend to be quite different from the oxides in terms of um, grain boundaries. So we extended this work on the antiperovskites to the hydrated form. Um, the antiperovskites, um, there was debate about that they took up water very readily um, 
and this is work of Hood and Song and Yushin published in Jackson Advanced Energy Materials. Essentially, the OH groups are actually creating more lithium vacancies and can increase the lithium ion conductivity. But the debate really was, was there any proton transport? And this stems from the fact that um, for those who've worked on proton conducting perovskites, as I have, there has been considerable um, work on proton conduction, proton transport in perovskites, but do they occur in these anti-perovskites? So we combine ab initio MD with NMR. So this is some uh, summary of some um, ab initio MD work where we um, looked at the mean square displacements as a function of time. As expected, there's no diffusion of oxygen or chloride. Interestingly, there's limited mobility of the proton with significant um, migration or diffusion of the lithium, as you'd expect. In fact, we can derive a diffusion coefficient of 10 to the minus centimeter squared per second, which nicely ties up with the PFG NMR, the pulse feed gradient NMR work, which also derived a diffusion coefficient of the same order. So why is there limited proton diffusion? Well, if you look at the structure of this anti perovskite it's very different from a classical oxide perovskite. The OO separation is now 3.9 angstroms versus typically 2.9 angstroms in barium serate or barium zirconate. And this was backed up by um, NMR. This was carried out by um, Karen Johnston's group up at Durham and she performed some really elegant um, NMR work. I'm just summarizing some of her work. I'm not an expert on NMR. So this is variable temperature magic angle spinning NMR uh, from about 19 degrees Celsius up to 106 degrees Celsius. And what we find that the single resonance confirms that the lithium and protons are in a single environment, but also uh, some of the proton NMR suggests that there's no long range transport. It's very much local diffusion, a local mobility of the proton um, from the proton NMR. And this is confirmed from the ab initio MD again. So this is on the left, the iron trajectories of lithium around the red oxygens. I don't know if you can see, but you can roughly see some octahedra around the oxygens of where the lithiums are largely um, located. In red, or these red dots, I've highlighted some lithium hops, some lithium vacancies hops along the edge of the octahedra. So there is lithium diffusion. However, on the proton side, what you see, and this is the proton in black, you see just a rotational motion around the oxygen. So there's no significant or no real hopping between the oxygen sites. You can see it's very much localized around the oxygen. So you're getting these OH um, rotation. And this was published in Energy Environmental Science uh, in 2018. We then looked at um, what would we do if we changed the proton concentration? And we find that if we increase the proton concentration, i.e. increasing the lithium vacancy, um, you can see that the conductivity goes up, the actual displacements go up. So we are finding a higher lithium diffusion with increasing proton concentration, which is quite nice because it's a, another sort of um, design tuning or tuning mechanism to increase the lithium conductivity. So the take home message here is that this is seen as a potential electrolyte material. There are um, some challenges, obviously, um, but what's interesting is that the proton incorporation tunes the lithium ion conductivity. Uh, because of time, I'll quickly move on to a quick aside. So this is a very quick break before I move on to dessert. Uh, 
I was very privileged and honoured to be invited to give the Royal Institution Christmas lectures for BBC. Um, they're very much a BBC Christmas institution. Um, for those who don't know, many of you probably don't know about them, they were founded by the great Michael Faraday uh, back in 1825. He wanted to promote science to the general public and to uh, school children. It was then televised by the BBC in 1936. And I gave some lectures in 2016 on BBC um, on the theme of energy. And I showed how a battery works by, uh, by the lemon. I'm sure some of you have done this as a school demo. You can use uh, a copper nail and a magnesium strip. But I wanted to go large. I wanted to go very large. So I produced, uh, or the group produced, a lemon battery with the highest voltage ever. We used 1,008 lemons. We cut them in half to produce 2016 lemon slices. And so this is true cutting edge technology. Sorry about that. Um, and actually the most difficult part was putting those IKEA shells together. So there's a bit of a Swedish connection there. And we generated, um, we generated 1,275 volts. And that is a Guinness World Record. So if you have the Guinness manual or look on the website, there's a Guinness World Record next to my name and the Royal Institution. So I'm very proud of that. So let me move on to dessert uh, because time is running short. And this relates to the flagship um, institution, the Fraud Institution. This is the UK flagship, um, I suppose, research program on battery materials for electric vehicles. Um, I lead one a project called New Next Generation Lithium Ion Cathode Materials uh, called CatMat. Um, there is a sister one called Future Cat, led by Serena Core at Sheffield. Um, I lead this with uh, Ben Morgan at Bath, and our partners are Oxford, Cambridge, Birmingham, Liverpool, and UCL. And I'm sure most of those names are familiar to you. So the background is obviously to try and generate high energy density cathode materials. Um, as you know, the, the prototype material is lithium cold oxide. Then we went to NMC. Um, I suppose 622 is about 180 milliampere hours per gram. NMC 811, about 200. And I think in the near term, these will probably dominate the NMC, the nickel rich NMCs. But there's a lot of research looking at lithium rich NMC and lithium rich layered oxide. So lithium rich here means that the lithium the transition metal ratio is greater than one. You increase the capacity by now um, enabling oxygen redox into the system. But there are significant challenges um, around voltage fade and surface oxygen loss. But the energy densities are higher, greater than 250 milliampere hours per gram. Uh, some of the key players in this field, I suppose some of the pioneers were Mike Thackeray uh, and Jeff Dahn, but um, in the last five years, considerable work by uh, Jean-Marie Tarascon, uh, um, Dublé at Montpellier, uh, Bruce at Oxford, Gert Seder at Berkeley, um, Will Chu at Stanford and Shirley Meng at Santiago, and some of the systems I've listed there. Uh, because of time, I'm going to just slip the next, miss the next bit and move over to the next slide. So the other area, as well as the lithium rich layered, is are the disordered rock salt cathodes. And these were introduced um, with an elegant talk, as always, by Gert Seder. And essentially, you've got the classic rock salt structure. And that rock salt structure now is occupied by um, the cation sites are a, a mixture of lithium transition metal ions. The anion sites are occupied by oxygen fluoride for the um, 
oxygen fluoride, and for the pure oxides, there might be oxygen vacancies as well. So let me summarize some of the materials. I think the, the pioneering work, some of it was by Yabuchi, Wang and Seda on the lithium niobium oxides, on the lithium vanadium oxyfluorides mentioned by Christina. There was uh, Fickner and Hahn. Stan Whittingham has been looking at these and Bauer and Fickner again more recently. Some other materials are the pure oxide, the lithium manganese oxide by, by Prelong and the manganese oxyfluoride developed by Rob House and Peter Bruce. And I should note right at the bottom left, some really nice work on the, um, the uh, manganese D0 systems. So what, about, what is it about these systems? So the capacity can be really high, 250 to 320 milliampere per gram. So we're touching, you know, towards um, 1,000 in terms of watt hours per gram. So we're moving away from cobalt. There's a limited surface oxygen loss, and there's less first cycle hysteresis in many of these systems. So I'm going to focus on some recent work we've been doing on the disordered roxyl oxyfluoride. Um, this has a, a capacity of about 280 milliampere per gram, um, limited surface oxygen loss, and less first cycle voltage drop, um, which you can see in the schematic on the bottom right. And that's comparing it uh, with the pink um, line is for a, a classic lithium rich layered oxide. So the question really for this material is, what is the manganese oxygen redox and how is the local coordination and is there O2 formation? So we did some DFT combined with X-ray absorption spectroscopy and RICS, which is resonant inelastic um, X-ray scattering. The last results slide, I realize I'm running over. I'm sorry, Will. Sorry, Tracy. Um, the last results slide, I promise. We find from RICS, from resonant inelastic X-ray scattering, evidence of oxygen, bulk oxygen in the bulk. So on the left is the spectra starting from the pristine, going to charged, and then going to discharge. So it is reversible. So the O2 minus is being oxidized to O2 on charge. That molecular O2 is trapped in the lattice, and then the O2 is reduced on O2 on discharge. This is under ultra high vacuum conditions and we've done it at different temperatures. So there is no evidence of beam damage either. So that's the take home message for this oxyfluoride. So let me conclude. Um, I might quickly um, go through let me just show all of them and then um, because of time I could just talk through. I hope I've shown you that you can look at some complex materials at the atomic scale. I've talked about um, grain boundary effects, um, lithium transport and proton diffusion in the perovskites, anti-perovskites, and I've talked about manganese and oxygen redox overlap and bulk O2 in the lithium rich oxyfluoride and I apologize for perhaps rushing a bit at the end. Uh, in terms of the last slide is just a thanks. Um, you can um, look at the, the names there. And if you're interested in more details, there, there are some of the publications and the funding bodies on the right. And um, thank you for your attention. Thank you. Saifal, thank you so much for that. It was a very heavy meal. I think now we have to digest a bit, perhaps uh, cognac or brandy or whatever you drink. So let's see if you do so <laughs> scientific. Some, it's a, some branded Pratt Institution mug. Terrific. So the first question comes from Christian Mesquelia, and uh, he is asking, um, what are some of the sodium containing antiperovskites, uh, such as sodium-3 OBH4? Can you discuss some of the opportunities for solely electrolyte for sodium using the structure? Yes, so, um, well, thanks, Christian. I think, well, we've both been involved with looking at 
sodium ion conductors. Um, early on, looking at, I suppose, Nasicon type structures, which are the most well established um, in, in this field. Um, and I think there are some interesting results on the Na3OX antiprovskites. They don't show as high mobility as the lithium analogues, but there's some debate that Christian and I know about on the, the BH4 type anion in there, uh, whether it is actually promoting um, a paddle wheel or promoting high sodium ion conductivity. So th the simple answer is yes, I think there's considerable scope to explore the, um, the space on the sodium oxyhalide antiprovskites. I don't think they've been optimized, but there's a lot of work to be done. Thanks, Saifal. Uh, maybe a few more questions on solid electrolytes before we move on to the electrodes. Um, so there's a question on the stability of the solid electrolytes. Um, so you show this very nice uh, interfacial uh, transport at the tilted boundaries. Um, so the question concerns the stability against corrosion, for example, um, at the potentials of the negative electro, for example. Can you discuss a bit on that? Yes, I mean, we haven't um, specifically looked at that, but the, the question is absolutely right. It's a very important question about, I think if they're alluding to the stability, particularly against lithium metal, um, then yes, I mean, it is a big challenge and that there's a lot of work. I know some elegant work, for example, by Jürgen Janik um, and um, Peter Bruce looking at that, I suppose, degradation mechanisms and also void formation at that interface. I think it is an important area because ultimately in terms of a practical solid state cell, you need to deal with those um, lithium interfacial issues. As I said, we haven't looked at that specifically ourselves, um, but it is, um, it, it is a, a key issue. So I guess uh, um, maybe building on that a bit more, that question, um, are there indications that the grain boundaries in particular are less or more stable as a function of the misorientation against lithium, for example? That's a good point. I mean, the, the mechanism of that lithium penetration into the electrolyte um, is an interesting area. I mean, whether it's dendrite formation in the classical term called dendrite. So could those lithium penetrate within those grain boundary structures, for example? Um, I don't think we've, we've, we've seen that ourselves, or whether they're penetrating into other microstructural defects within the grains, which aren't grain boundaries as such, but others. And I know um, this interesting work, I think Yet Ming Chang at MIT has been looking at that. So to answer your question, Will, about, we haven't seen any evidence from our work, anyways, many simulation work of lithium dendrate or penetration into the grain boundary itself. But I, I suppose you can't exclude it either. Yeah, I think it's gonna be very interesting to think more about that. Um, maybe one last question on uh, the fundamentals of ionic transport in the antiperovskites. Uh, so you showed uh, this very nice picture of OH ions and uh, lithium ions moving through the same material. Um, could you comment on the extent of correlation between the two or the rotation of the OH somehow uh, cooperative or inhibits lithium transport? Oh, that's a lovely question. That's, a, uh, that's the kind of question I love. Uh, because because of time, I couldn't show you know, a whole host of other slides. So from both um, simulation and from NMR, indeed, there seems to be some correlation, some cooperative um, motion where um, the lithium hopping into those vacancies and the OH rotation in that, now that lithium vacant site is correlated. So there is some correlated motion between the lithium hopping and the OH rotation, which we find from both the ab initio MD and from 
the, um, the variable temperature mass NMR. So thank you for that question. I would, I would show you the slide, but I don't have control over the slide. So, but there is there somewhere. I don't know who asked the questions anonymous, so I'm not sure who to thank in particular. So that anonymous questioner, if you look at the energy environmental science paper, it's all in there. All right, thank you, Saifal. Um, so maybe this is a good uh, quick segue to electrodes. So still on the anti-perovskite, um, are there opportunities to introduce redox centers to the anti-perovskites to make them electrodes as well? The simple answer is yes. Yeah. Uh, in fact, um, one of the one of the aspects of the work in the Faraday Institution project that I talked about is exactly that. We are looking at some um, iron-based antiperovskites. Excellent. All right. So since Christian had the first question, he can also have the last question. Um, how <laughs> fast can lithium diffuse? in the oxyfluorides? In the, um, the, um, the cathode materials. Exactly. Yeah, they're, they're showing, so in terms of, they are disordered. So in terms of the percolation, you need some percolation pathways. The diffusion coefficients are of the order of 10 to the minus nine centimeters squared per second. So they are of the cathode rate. So the rate capability and electrokinetics are good. Outstanding sci-fi, so I, now I feel a bit more digested. Um, there are many more questions uh, that I could not mention. I, I'd um, suggest our audience uh, please reach out to Professor Izan directly. I'm sure he would be delighted to uh, carry on the discussion additionally. So now if I could ask Christina to rejoin us for just a very uh, quick panel discussion. All right. Welcome back, Christina. Thank you. Thank you. Now we have worked through our several courses of meal. Uh, I have now the pleasure of asking you some higher level questions. I think we have enjoyed listening to all the detailed scientific discussions. So I'd like to present you with the following question. Saifal, you've been working on computational material science uh, for a long time, and you have demonstrated um, its utility in predicting and understanding material properties. And Christina, you've been working on advanced characterization of interfaces and such. And in the Battery 2030 Plus, there is a significant focus on how to integrate theory and experiments. And I also noted uh, in your talk, um, AI, informatics, and data analysis. So I would like to ask a pointed question, if I may. We have done well in joining experiments in theory and data, but obviously the job is far from done. I was wondering first, can we talk about what haven't we accomplished? What are the big milestones that are still ahead of us? And the second question is, how do we get there? So perhaps I can have Saifal speak, maybe from the computational side, and then Christina can comment from the other end, and hopefully we have a better roadmap on how to achieve this integration cycle. Oh, I, I thought I thought Christina would go first, but I'll I'll. Uh, <laughs> uh, you go first. So, um, it's so what? So the question was, what haven't we achieved? Uh, I suppose in, um, in terms of theory, experiments, integration. Oh, in terms of theory, into, I, there's a lot of, obviously, there's a bit, on the positive side, there's been a lot of um, integration and um, synergy between computation experiment, as you cite, Will. What could we do more? I suppose the areas in terms of some of the key buzzwords that are being used at the moment is that we're going to have a lot more data so there's going to be um can we achieve that kind of data mining and whether it's through machine learning tools or other tools much more rapidly uh and with whether that rapid integration with high put throughput 
synthesis high throughput experiments could be integrated. So um, I suppose the, the pointed thing we haven't achieved, we haven't achieved um, an energy density that is greater than 500 milliampere hours per gram or so there are some things that, you know targets to get to that we would like to achieve uh, I think we haven't achieved very you know really efficient um, maybe maybe I'm wrong here but maybe really efficient integration of data mining with high throughput experimental experiments yet but I could be wrong and um, and I could be proven um, wrong by others around the globe. So continue along that point, a question, maybe I can ask one specific question before Christina weighs in as well. I, I, from my point of view, Saifel, and you and I have worked on this, um, yeah. I think using theory to understand phenomena in batteries has been incredible. We learned so much about mechanisms um, especially when they're experimentally inaccessible. But I think the other direction of that, um, predicting new materials purely from theoretical methods, I think has not been as far along as understanding existing materials. Can you give us a sense of what lies ahead and, and what more do we need to do to make these both directions more equal? in terms of understanding by theory and also predictions by theory for new materials? I think the, the issue with the prediction by theory, always the challenge has been that there isn't always just a single parameter to calculate. So you're right, um, my philosophy as a materials chemistry has always been to get to deeper fundamental understanding. Uh, I personally haven't been involved as much on the sort of um, high throughput screening computational work and there's been some you know, really good work out there. But I think the challenge from that high throughput is because there are a number of different parameters to make a successful prediction of a really good material. So it isn't just about a migration barrier or a cell voltage. It could be the stability with an interface. It could be grain boundaries. It could be surface oxygen loss. It could be predicting um, certain uh, formation in the bulk. So there's so many different aspects that sometimes high throughput screening only looks at one or two of those parameters rather than a multitude of parameters. And I think that's the challenge for the computational high throughput screens that really it should be maybe up towards 10 parameters for every system you're looking at. Saiful, thank you. Christina. Well, I think um, I agree very much with uh, Saiful and with what he has said, and also what you have said, Will. I think the predictive power with theory is coming closer. I think there have been large advancements, both because of the computers being much stronger, but also our understanding has become much longer. When it comes to high throughput experiments, I think we do generate a lot of data as experimentalists, but how much of them are we really using and how much of them are we actually trusting? And uh, if you look at the publications, are they really based on a statistical, uh, if you have a good material and show something what you call superior, uh, remarkable and outstanding, which are concepts I hate by the way, because that's up to me as a reader to judge if they are or not. Um, is that the one cell out of 100 which sh shows really good performance or is it a true sample of 100 cells, the average of that? And by having a lot of data and the data mining we can do, we can also learn from bad data, I think, uh, a lot that can be useful. And with the robotics that we're developing, we might also start to be able as scientists to have labs where we can screen a lot of, of this matrix we need to have. I agree with um, Saifa there and it's not just one parameter you can look at, but you can try to bake it down to model systems and then 
increase the complex complexity of a system to look at it. And I think there are embryos at different universities is now building up. I, I mentioned um, Martin Winter's um, electrolyte uh, robotic laboratory at University of Münster is one really good example in Europe. And I think more is coming in that direction. And I think also with the, uh, there is a great interest from the synchrotron and uh, neutron facilities in Europe to also be part of this developing their tools so that you can screen a lot more of batteries that maybe have cycled for a long time uh, to really be able to show what's happening in the beginning of, of a fresh battery and what's happening at the end of, a, of this battery with different kinds of tools. So uh, it's a very exciting uh, future, I think, to try to build this together in a way we haven't done before. And um, I think um, I think uh, the predictive level uh, of, um, of theory has made it, we suggest this material from theory, we test it, is it possible to synthesize or not, and then you go back to the table and, and do some more modeling, come up with something new, and you don't know if you can synthesize it. So if you can build that to a loop system in a better way, and loop these things much faster, um, by using all the data we generate. I hope we can take a step forward. Because my, my private philosophy is that, it, yes, lithium batteries, lithium ion batteries will be in applications for a long time. If we need to have them for transport sector, we might need actually to have other battery chemistry from other applications because of the lack of raw materials, etc. And that means that we have to also make other batteries to work better and, and uh, come to the same level as we have for the lithium ion batteries. I'm thinking of sodium, I think of redox flow, we can think of the multivalent, etc. And there we have other kinds of issues with the chemistries and this complexity that we have, we have been talking to about this uh, few hours now when we have met. Yeah, I certainly agree, Christina. There's no silver bullet, so to speak. And no. uh, the methodologies I think uh, both of you are developing um, should apply to all of those problems. Uh, maybe to, to conclude, Christina, I, I have now another pointy question for you as well. Um, mm -hmm. You spoke about the opportunities to work clo or more closely between industry and academia. Mm -hmm. And you specifically mentioned this data sharing. Mm. Industry indeed generates significantly more data than in academia, but it is not open. And yeah. uh, if I just look at, for example, the efforts on battery cell level modeling, mm. um, the number of open data set is really tiny compared to what is available out there. Sitting from where you are at the leadership of Battery 2030 Plus, what are some of the key ingredients you think to get industry and academia better connected in terms of data openness and obviously it has to be done on a pre-competitive basis um, how do you give incentives for everybody to open up uh, in order to achieve the greater goal of um, um, accelerating r d and I, again i apologize for being pointy here um, but it would oh, really no, no. It, it, it's a, a, absolutely a, a, an issue and an important question and not so easy but what we try to do in the BigMap project is, of course, to define some certain chemistries where the uh, companies involved can actually make their model cells, maybe not the ones that you have in your core business. My example for the post-mortem system was made by a cell producer, and it was not, not their uh, commercial um, uh, generation. So you can actually convince them that they can make some model systems and be part of the modeling algorithm learning curve and how to and develop these methods, because I think it's an interest there for the industry because they can use that in their own. I think yeah, there are companies already that have made a big library of, of uh, also publications and try to do mine, um, data mining through them. So um, you have to convince the companies that they think this is important and have a clear vision of what you want to do and why you are doing it. 
And then you can actually find ways of defining the systems. I have my own example with Scania and Volvo at the same table. As long as not it's that core business you, you sort of um, try to, to reveal, I think you can actually find ways of working together. Christina, I think this is a very important and admirable goal. Uh, good luck to all of us as we try to build this. Um, so I'd like to take this opportunity to thank Christina and Saiful for your excellent contributions today. I neglected to mention that this is our 10th seminar. Uh, so thank you for joining us. And uh, Justin, if I can have the next slide, please. Perfect. Hey. Uh, maybe you can introduce um, an exciting development in our uh, seminar series uh, coming up next on September 18th. Yeah, sounds good. Uh, first of all, let me thank uh, Christina and Safer for uh, really excellent talks and introducing what's going on in, in European Union. <coughs> and also, well, well, thank, you, thank you for the invitation and uh, the opportunity. Thank you again. Yeah. Yes, thank you so much. It was a great experience. Yeah. So uh, as Will mentioned, right, we have our 10th exciting uh, symposium series. Uh, starting from the next one, our 11th of uh, event, um, we are going to move on to a new stage, continue to have a platform like this of academia to, to come out, but also very exciting. We want to engage industry like the, in the panel discussion we, we have. Uh, so the first one we are going to launch, that's on September 18. Right, that's our next event. We understand many places are on vacation, so we'll, we'll give uh, uh, people a little bit of break. So next event is September 18, also Friday, the same time. We are going to have industry leaders to uh, come in to present the first panel that's on silicon and notes and pre-lithiation. Uh, Dr. Kang San, is, who is the CEO of Amprius, taking silicon nanowire nanotechnology and silicon graphite mixture to the um, product stage. Jim Kershen, and it, who is the manager of Applied Materials, will also present a new exciting thin lithium foil for lithium metal anode as well as for pre-lithiation. And Sanji Kumar, CEO of Zin Labs, will also talk about silicon anode. We look forward to the engagement of uh, industry uh, uh, with academia, with national lab. I, I'm sure there will be investors also showing up as well to listen to these talks. Uh, thank you very much all for uh, you and Europe and Asia now staying late. Um, we'll uh, see you next time. <laughs>